This is uh, Matt Cochran, and uh, welcome to the Snack and Learn webinar. Uh, this webinar is going to be about wetland and stream restoration to reduce eutrophication and sequester carbon. I'll be going through some examples from Denmark. Um, just uh, as a reminder to everyone, uh, there's uh, time at the end uh, to answer, to, to ask questions. Um, if you please uh, write the questions in the question box, then uh, we'll get to them at the end. Um, and also to note that uh, the presentation is available um, to download in the handout box um, within the webinar. To introduce myself, um, again, uh, my name is Matt Cochran. I'm a senior project manager in the Nature Air Restoration Area Manager for WSP in Denmark. Um, I'm, I have a master's degree in wetlands restoration ecology from The Ohio State University. And uh, I am certified as a professional wetland scientist and a certified ecological restoration practitioner. To, to start the presentation, give you a little uh, information, a little background information on, uh, on wetlands and, and Danish way of doing things, uh, the problems here. Give you uh, some information on the Danish restoration types. Uh, introduce some of the WSP services that we provide here and, uh, and run through some examples of, uh, of some of the projects that we've completed. And uh, again, there'll be time at the end for some questions and answers. Today, approximately 60% of Denmark's area is intensely cultivated. And as you can see on the, on the aerial photo, since the Stone Age, Danes have been trying to expand and dewater arable land uh, for agricultural purposes. Especially during the 20th century, drainage and drainage projects were carried out in virtually all Danish river valleys and lowland areas. Streams were straightened, meadows and bogs were drained, lakes and fjords were drained by establishing dikes and pumping stations. The intensification of agriculture in Denmark has also had several negative consequences. Stream systems have been hydraulically strained and altered. Nature in and around streams have been negatively affected. Coastal areas have received an increased runoff of nitrate and phosphorus. And in the 1960s, signs of eutrophication began to appear in the fjords with increased growth of pollution related macroalgae. As you can see, the algae mats on the top left picture and the algae growing on common eelgrass in the type right pictures, these were taken out by the, the coast. And in, in September of 1981, the first major fish die off was seen in inland Danish waters due to a lack of oxygen in the water. This is a result of too much nitrogen and phosphorus in the water due to runoff from agricultural lands. In 1987, the Danish government started introducing plans to reduce the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that ends up in the lakes and the coastal waters. Through the years, wetlands started playing a major role in cleaning the water. Wetlands are ecosystems characterized by water or flooded areas, marshes, swamps, bogs, riparian forests, and estuaries. And flooding results in oxygen-free environment where specific microbial processes break down nutrients and pollutants. Wetlands are like the Earth's kidneys. They filter out waste and pollutants. They're one of the most biologically diverse ecosystems that support thousands of plants and animals. Wetlands have many ecosystem services, including water purification, groundwater replenishment, water storage, flood control, carbon sequestration, among others. From a climate change perspective, they also stabilize shorelines, provide storm protection, and sequester carbon uh, if restored. In Denmark, there are four different wetland restoration types based on the ecological goal they're trying to improve. The first types are, are marsh and riparian wetlands, so-called nitrogen wetlands. And these wetlands are primarily designed to remove nitrogen from streams that discharge into fjords and coastal waters. This is accomplished by bringing drainage water to the surface and have the water flow through the wetland or establishing shallow lakes, raising and re-meandering streams and restoring riparian areas to create periodical flooding. Phosphorus wetlands 
uh, are designed to reduce phosphorus runoff to lakes by raising and re-meandering streams and restoring the riparian areas uh, to create regular flooding. The next type of wetland projects involve bogs or peatlands, and they're called lowland wetlands or climate lowland wetlands. The objectives of lowland wetlands are to restore areas rich in peat and reduce greenhouse gas emissions by restoring the natural hydrology by capping drains and removing ditches or stopping pump, pumping of the areas. Climate, climate lowland wetlands are essentially the same as lowland wetlands, but there is more focus on synergy with the European Union habit, birds and habitats directives that tour 2000 areas, biodiversity, protected natural areas, clean drinking water, outdoor activity, organic agriculture, and climate adaption projects. The goal of lowland wetlands is to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions by 70% by 2030. To show a typical wetland restoration project, I'll go through the steps and services WSP provides to our clients. One of the first things we do is survey the streams and ditches for every 100 meters using a GPS or total station. This gives us data and information about the stream channel and tributaries. Here you can see that the stream flows from the south to the north as a blue line and the ditches as green lines. The project area is indicated by a yellow uh, line or polygon. On the right is an example of a longitudinal profile of the stream showing the elevations for the stream bed, the water elevation, and all the tributaries. It also shows all the drains that were present at the time of surveying. Next, we collect information on historical drains from a drain archive and draw these drains into a GIS map. Then we survey the elevation, location, and size of the drains that can be found to verify the information and use the information to design the project. To the right is an example of an old drain map from our archive. These drain maps are typically from the 1940s to the 1960s because of the Danish government helped subsidize the cost of draining the land at that time. Another important part of the technical investigation is locating all the utilities. All the utility companies in the area are contacted to provide information on, on sewer lines, drinking water lines, electricity lines, natural gas pipes, telephone cables and fiber optic cables and more. Here you can see that there are several utilities that cross the southern part of the project area. In order to calculate phosphorus loads and carbon dioxide reduction, we need to gather soil samples. To do this, we draw one and a half hectare plots in a JS map and then go out in the field and take a soil core in the middle of each plot to describe the soil characteristics. A soil sample is taken in every plot and then sent to a laboratory and analyzed for phosphor, iron, and peat concentrations that are used in the respective calculations. Another important aspect of the technical investigation is gathering flora and fauna data from the municipality for their protected areas. This information is found in GIS maps. Once we have the existing data, we make surveys of the areas to confirm or remap the protected area boundaries. We also investigate the presence of endangered species in their habitat. This information is used to perform environmental impact assessments where we evaluate impacts to protected species and protected nature areas. To the right is an example of the vegetation in this particular area with wetland grasses and sedge species. To the left is also an area where there are trees and, and willow trees found. Once we have gathered data, we need to model the existing hydrology based on survey surveying results and historical water flow data to create a hydrologic model of the project area. We use WSP's hydrology program VASP or MIC models to graphically show the current drainage conditions. This is done by using the hydrological model results for various stream flows and the available uh, digital terrain model to show existing surface water levels. This is done by creating different elevation layers for the surface water and the terrain with the programs. 
we then divide the drainage depths into 25 centimeter contours and give a different color to each contour. In this example, you can um, you can see that the area is not colored or colored with brown and dark green. Brown color indicates that the water level is a meter to a meter 25 centimeters under the terrain. And on the picture to the right, the results are confirmed because you can see that the stream is much lower than the grazing area to the left of the picture and the cornfield on the right. This is a, a typical uh, typical picture of a, of a, a project area that when we start. In order to restore this area back to a wetland, we develop an initial design to raise and re-meander the stream. We want to raise the water level significantly in the area. In this project, we've re-meandered the stream, which is the blue line running north and south, and created small lakes in the northern part of the area, indicated by the, the blue areas. We've also opened the drains at the edge of the project area to bring drain water to the surface and trickle through the wetland. This is uh, indicated by the light blue areas that come out from the, the red lines that are the, the drains. We've also filled in the ditches indicated by the, the light tan lines and the, the light tan circles are removal of, the, uh, of the, the wells, the drainage wells. After the initial design is completed, we model the future hydrology based on the design and the historical water flow data. Again, this is done by using the future hydrological model results for various stream flows and the available digital terrain model to show future surface water levels. The same method is used as before. In this example, you can, you can see that much of the area is colored blue and light green with the edges brown and dark green, which means that the area is now much wetter. The dark blue areas indicates that water is at the surface. Light blue indicates that the water is within 25 centimeters of the surface. On the right is an example of what we are aiming for, raising the water table close to the terrain and creating wetlands. Once the initial design is completed, we make a property feasibility investigation. We talk and present the design to all the landowners to get their input and feedback on the project. We also confirm information, data that has been gathered and ask for more information, especially about drains. Here you can see all the 22 individual landowners that have, that have land within the project area. During the meeting with the landowners are presented with compensation models to be included in the project and land acquisition options if they would like to sell their land. All this information is summed up in a report stating the, stating the landowner's interest in the project. In order to complete the investigation, we have to calculate the nitrogen and phosphorus retention as well as the carbon sequestration. There are minimum requirements for each type of, of project. There are standardized spreadsheets for calculated nitrogen and phosphorus retention that have been developed in cooperation with several Danish universities. Input parameters include the topographical watershed for the stream, the watershed for the project area, precipitation data, soil type, land use, and results from the soil and water samples that we collected earlier. It is also necessary to calculate the number of flooding days and the size of the flooding area using the results from the hydrology model. To calculate carbon sequestration, Aarhus University has developed a standard spreadsheet and mapped areas within Denmark with high concentrations of peat. Input parameters for these calculations include land use, soil types, the amount of peat or carbon in the soils based on the previous mapping, and results from the soil samples that have been collected. Other input parameters are drainage depth from the hydrology model and the project area. The spreadsheet calculates the amount of carbon sequestration after converting the area to a wetland in tons of carbon dioxide per hectare per year. To the right, you can see a map showing high peak concentrations based on data from all the University of Aarhus. After the technical and prop property feasibility investigations, the municipalities and the landowners need to come to an agreement in order to proceed with the project. This assumes that the project 
meets the minimum requirements for each project type. WSP then helps our clients by completing the detailed design for the project, including drawings, calculations, and all the project specifications. WSP can also help communicate with the authorities to achieve the proper permits and carry out the restoration. Then the tender documents are finalized and sent to the construction companies. We then review the incoming proposals and make recommendations to the client, including negotiating the contract. The final stage includes supervising and managing the construction and reporting the final project to the authorities. To give some examples of WSP's wetland restoration projects, here's an example of a nitrogen wetland along Seamus to the stream. There were two streams re-meandered and 41 hectares of wetlands restored in 2017. There were many drains brought to the surface to trickle through the wetlands. Here you can see the results just after the construction was completed. Note that the area is already very wet. Nitrogen retention was calculated at 3.6 tons and the phosphorus retention to 500 kilograms per year. Next example is also a nitrogen wetland. This project is located in the northern part of Denmark along Little Stream and completed in 2015. There were 215 hectares of wetlands and 11 kilometers of streams restored. The stream was raised, re-meandered, and reconnected to the floodplain. Since the restoration, five areas with alkaline fins have been located. This is significant because these habitats are protected by the European Union Habitat Directive. And there are four areas with broad-leaved marsh orchids located, which is very good indication of a successful restoration. Next example is a, is a large lake in wetland restoration completed in 2012. The lake is called Konoop Lake and located in the northern part of Denmark. The project restored a 150 hectare lake and 260 hectares of wetlands along the periphery. There were four pumps taken out of service and removed, seven kilometers of dikes bulldozed, and 25 kilometers of drains and ditches destroyed or filled. There were a total of 75,000 cubic meters of soil moved to complete this project. The next example is a phosphorus wetland located in the western part of Denmark. The goal of this project was to remove phosphorus from the stream before it ended up in Limby Lake. This project was completed in 2019 and restored 10.3 hectares of wetlands and 1.2 kilometers of streams. You can see Limby Lake in the background and a small portion of the meandered stream in the foreground. The project included creating small berms across the project area to create flooding during extreme precipitation. The pipes in the berms are big enough to transport a normal amount of water, but are too small to transport larger amounts of water, which results in flooding. The last example is a lowland wetland restoration. This project is currently under construction and will restore 19.8 hectares of wetlands and half a kilometer of streams. The main purpose of this wetland restoration is to take the area out of agriculture and restore it to peatlands, thus reducing the emission of greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide. The area is currently pumped down to about one meter under sea level in order to farm it. The project consists of removing the pump and strengthening an existing dike to protect the houses to the right. The terrain within the pumped area has sunk over the years by over the last 50 years because of pumping. Um, it has sunk uh, about a meter. The results will be a, a permanent shallow lake because of the terrain is now below sea level. For wetland projects in Denmark, some of the key challenges include the landowners because all the projects are voluntary. This is also one of the main reasons that many projects are not completed. Another key challenge is meeting all the minimum requirements for the different types of wetlands. The minimum requirement for nitrogen and phosphorus retention must, must be met in order to fund the restoration. But over the past five or six years, the minimum requirements have been, have been lowered or they're eased in order, to, in order to restore more and more wetland areas. The last key challenge is money. 
In order to complete the wetland restorations, the landowners are compensated for loss of agricultural productivity or they sell their land to the government. There are also many costs associated with the construction. The total costs of the project have to be reasonable compared to the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus retained or the carbon sequestered. Lastly, WSP always prioritizes contributing to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Wetland restoration projects contribute to number three, good health and well being, number six, clean water and sanitation, number 13, climate action, 14, life below water, and 15, life on land. Um, I mentioned the use of, of VASP, which is a WSP program primarily used in Denmark. In February of this year, two of my colleagues presented a snack and learn presentation on, on VASP. If you'd like further information about the VASP program, there is a link provided in the presentation. This concludes my presentation and would like to thank everyone for listening. My contact information is provided on this slide. And please feel free to contact me in the future if you'd like to hear more. Thanks again. Now there are time for some questions. Thank you, Matt, for a fantastic presentation. So before moving into the Q&A period, I would like to remind attendees to enter your questions in the question box on the GoToWebinar platform. And also you can download the PDF version of the presentation from the handout box on the dashboard. I will start with the first question, but if you can just open your webcam, please. Thank you. Start to finish. How long does the typical project like this uh, take from conception, sorry, from concept to construction completion? Um, yes, normally, um, normally it takes several years. Um, to do the technical investigations usually takes around a year. And then uh, to get the landowners and the economy in place and everything, it usually takes another year or more. And then the construction, the detailed design and construction works usually takes at least a year, year and a half. On a on a typical project, if it's if it's streamlined, it can go within a matter of I would say three three years. Um, sometimes it normally takes up to five or six years, depending on what types of projects they are. Thank you. Next question is, uh, do you monitor the wetlands after the construction to see the actual results, like monitor plants, soils, uh, retention of nitrogen and phosphorus? Um, unfortunately, we do not. That is uh, one of the things that uh, is very interesting about the projects in Denmark. Um, there is no money set aside um, like there are in other parts of the world to, to monitor and make sure that uh, the wetlands live up to, to what has been uh, calculated and expected. Um, I know based in the US, they usually have a monitoring period of between five and seven years. Um, in Denmark, they, they do not do this. Um, however, it's becoming more and more popular that some of the universities get involved and follow some of these projects uh, before the construction and after the construction to see if the results actually are correct. Thank you. Can you explain how these projects are funded in Denmark? Sure. Um, because of the, the water framework directive as of right now, um, it's, uh, it's over a 15 year period and three planning stages. And um, in order to meet the good ecological um, status in all the streams and lakes and, and fjord waters, um, Denmark is under obligation to go through and, and perform a lot of these wetland restoration projects to remove the nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, the vast majority, um, at, at this time, I'm going to say probably at least 95% of all the wetland projects are funded through the European Union in the Water Framework Directive. Um, there are the new wetland projects that have just started to come out, these climate uh, lowland projects. They're funded by the Danish uh, government themselves. Um, so there's there's a tendency now to that the Danish government wants to be more active and, and try to get more projects uh, through and completed. Um, as I said, the, the projects tend to take a long time to do. So uh, the more uh, projects that can be completed, the easier it is for Denmark to live up to the Water Framework Directive. Thank you. Do you involve the public in these kind of projects? 
the the public uh, plays an, an active role um, absolutely the um, from the very beginning uh, the the landowners are are involved um, depending on the size of the project um, the larger projects they're usually uh, set up some sort of a uh, a group of representatives from the from the landowners to talk with um, but all of the landowners are 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 talked with and informed throughout the project. Um, it's up to the municipalities or the, the the government entity that's running the projects to to inform the the, the landowners. But uh, it's a it's an essential part of uh, of success in, in doing these projects that they're properly informed and that they take ownership of the wetland projects as well. Usually. Not all the time, but usually the the public or the landowners would like these uh, projects um, developed, especially the the areas that have been pumped, because it's becoming harder and harder uh, to pump these areas because the the land has has sunk over the years. Very integral part, though, to get the public involved. Thank you. Do you consider rainfall data during the initial design stage? Uh, rightful data. Is that, is that what you said? Sorry, uh, rainfall. Rainfall data. Um, we have to use it in the in the models, um, and it's an integral part uh, of doing the calculations as far as nitrogen and phosphorus. And uh, this data is is available from the from a a, a national um, uh, ministry, I guess, uh, uh, that collects information on this and it's made available. Uh, to everyone, it's uh, public information. Thank you. Are landowners cooperative during project execu execution? And what is the mitigation if agreement is not reached? Um, the majority of the landowners are cooperative. Um, not all the time. Um, it depends on on the the instance in the project. Um, but the vast majority are. Um, if if the landowners, if if there's a huge project, a very large project, and there's maybe one or two uh, landowners that don't want the project, um, then there there are instances where the the, the municipalities will go in and, and actually um, compensate the landowners by buying their their land and forcing them to be part of it if it's for the better good of the of nature and, and for the municipality and for Denmark as a whole. Um, it's very rare, but it, it, it has happened a couple of times. Thank you. There are a lot, uh, additional more questions. However, I will take the last one. Uh, additional questions will be answered uh, directly by Matt. Do you mm -hmm. use carbon credits to offset costs? Um, at the moment, um, we, we do not use carbon credits. It's a it's an upcoming um, thing here in Denmark. The the climate wetlands and climate lowland wetlands that we've talked about are starting to come into the carbon credits questions. Um, the majority of these lowland projects that have to be completed are in order to meet um, quotas set by uh, the Danish government and the European Union as far as carbon sequestration. And, and removing agriculture from these lowland areas where they can sequester a, a great deal of carbon. And that's where the carbon credits come into. At the moment, um, with doing wetlands, it's not based on carbon credits, but at the same time, it's, it's based on a larger calculation by the Danish government to fulfill their requirements to reduce carbon emissions. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, and thank you everyone for your questions. Uh, this will be answered uh, directly by Matt via email. So we are at the end of our webinar session. Uh, please feel free to follow up directly with Matt via the contact details shown on the screen. And I would like to thank all attendees for joining today and thank you, Matt, for a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. I will wrap up the webinar now. Thank you.